Welcome to After the Deluge. I'm Justin Cox. Season 2 is about bright eyes. Feeders and Mirrors was recorded deep in the snowy Omaha winter of 1999 and released on May 29th of the year 2000. It was a massive moment for this little record label band collective they called Saddle Creek. And honestly, even after spending a ton of time with these early records and talking to Tim Kasher in episode one, it's kind of hard to grasp how Oberst goes from making, he goes from making this collection of songs as a teenager to making something this big and ambitious very quickly. And it kind of sums up the early Bright Eyes story, really, and all the Wonderkin press coverage and all that that kind of came up on the periphery of Connor Oberst and Bright Eyes. With Fevers and Mirrors, he's still under the radar, but just barely, and not for long. He's six years younger than the Cursive and the Faint guys, but he's about to take the scene that they built and kick it up a notch. The beauty in all of that is you can tell everyone involved is all in on it, all supportive of it. It's the vibe you get, at least. Um, They all appear on the record. They help assemble the actual mirrors on the sleeves. It really feels like a collective thing where the rising tide floats all boats that's probably me ascribing some romantic stuff to it but i don't know it really feels that way for this record we get a proper in the moment pitchfork review by taylor m clark i think i said in the first episode that the letting off the happiness review felt fine to me at a 6.8 clark gives this one a 5.4 which says more about pitchfork at the time and how they felt about quote unquote this kind of music than it does about Bright Eyes or this record. That score is obviously low. And naturally, they took another look at it when it was re-released in 2012, and now she's got a shiny old 9.0 on there. And our guest today is Ian Cohen, who wrote that Pitchfork review of the reissue back in 2012. We talked plenty about it in the conversation that follows, so I'm going to leave that alone for now. I know a ton of people hate this thing where Pitchfork goes back and reassesses stuff they did back in the dirty old past. And I get it, I guess, kind of. Really, I guess, in the sense that like some of those scores might have impacted bands' careers or the public perception of genres or something. And I I I guess that's true to a certain point, but I also think like that was like the very, very beginning of when we just started blogging our opinions onto the internet and all this stuff is just ever changing the way it still is now and all the more reason to take another look at them later in my opinion you know it's not like they're deleting the old review that thing still exists too and we're about to take a look at it right now before we kick over to my conversation with ian taylor m clark begins scarcely free of his teenage years bright eyes connor oberst has attempted to create a mature cohesive concept album of sorts he has shot for the moon but skids to a halt on the ground, hindered by young wings. Granted, I'm 20, he's 20. Far be it from me to criticize the efforts of those my age based solely on our greenness. But as my grandmother would say, Oberst's eyes are a lot bigger than his stomach. What's funny is he's right that this feels like Oberst shooting for the moon, but he shoots further on the next album. And then the next release cycle involves two separate records of two separate genres and then the next one after that is even more tightly kind of concept driven than any of the previous ones it's like no this is kind of just a person who gets an idea and then goes about trying to make it into a thing and not just like a hey here are the last 12 songs i've written over the last two years but like a here's the record i'm putting out That's kind of why I was excited to do season two of this show about Bright Eyes is that these records really feel like chapters, you know? I'm going to read this whole next passage in full because it's kind of crucial to this review and I think the way he feels about it, about the record, clearly. And it's something that Ian and I spend a good amount of time on. So much of what passes for emotional and intellectual depth on this album is blatantly contrived nonsense. This would never have been so terribly obvious had he not placed a gut-wrenchingly ludicrous staged radio interview with himself at the end of an attempt to tip the scales. I simply cannot stress enough what a maddeningly self-indulgent mass of pseudo-depth this section of the album falls into. In this sickening chunk of narcissism, 
Oberst makes a laughable attempt to prove to his listeners that he is of a penetratingly deep intelligence by spouting strings of stale aphorisms that pass for rich understanding amongst those reluctant to have original thought. Not only this, but the mock interviewer actually interrupts Oberst to tell him how brilliant the album is. On the actual record, he says this. First, let me say that this is a brilliant record, man. We're all really into it here at the station. We get lots of calls. It's really good stuff. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So, talk a little bit about some of the symbolism. I hate to sound haughty, but I have honestly never witnessed such tasteless, ostentatious self-promotion on an album by anyone. It must be heard to be believed. Okay, Taylor M. Clark clearly never heard the Mike Jones record from the early 2000s where he gives us his phone number and says his name 700 times. I'm Mike Jones, don't act like you don't know my name. Ain't nothing changed but my change, I'm gonna stay the same. Like I said, Ian and I have some fun with that section of the album, so I'm gonna save it for the interview. The review concludes with... In most places, Fevers and Mirrors makes for an interesting listen considering its flaws. The instrumentation is diverse and tastefully orchestrated by a large cast, and it's clear that a great deal of thought and talent has been contributed to its making. Unfortunately, the album is also contrived and makes too blatant an effort to convince the listener of Ober's tragic wisdom. It's a record that can be enjoyable in select places and definitely shows signs of potential, yet falls victim to mediocrity when held against the work of truly developed musicians. Oberst is in the early stages of developing a talent that will likely take some years to fully mature. When it does, I look forward eagerly to the result. For the time being, he's a far cry from excellent. You know, I don't agree with the sentiment of the review. I think this album is excellent, but I don't think it's horribly written. You know, he makes some perfectly fine points. This is a young kid being pretty dramatic um he leaves room for him to improve i know that if i was tasked to write this review as a 20 year old i probably would have written like "Ooh, yeah this guy's sad like me um this is really speaking to me and i would have had nothing more thoughtful to say than that and actually there are some pull quotes that i didn't include here because we talk about them later on that ian and i both kind of agree with um I personally believe this is the moment where the early, innocent, um, lack of resources, bright eyes kind of meets the peak zeitgeist tapping brilliant um, period. You know, if he fully arrives at that on the next couple of albums that come out right here, he's he's essentially there, but he's still very much, very much in Omaha. He's the kid still, you know. And there's something very beautiful about that. I love talking about it. And I really enjoyed going back to this album. Like the reviewer kind of suggests, I'd still say the best is still out there on the horizon. But catch me on the right day and I might tell you that it's right here on this record. I am Justin Cox and you can find me tweeting about Bright Eyes and Killer Whales and baseball and stuff on Twitter at Routine Layup. And if you want the deluxe version of this podcast, which why wouldn't you? You can get bonus content, ad-free episodes, and a zine that I will hand make all about this season of After the Deluge and Bright Eyes and all these albums mailed to you at patreon.com slash after the deluge. My guest today is Ian Cohen, a longtime critic at Pitchfork, among many other publications, and co-host of the IndieCast podcast with Stephen Hyden, who... Fun fact, is also an alum of this very podcast. He was on season one, and we talked about Jackson Brown's record Late for the Sky and that iconic scene in Taxi Driver. Here is my conversation about Fevers and Mirrors with Ian Cohen. Okay, Ian, welcome to the show. Thanks for doing it. Yeah, thanks for having me. Awesome. All right, well, where I want to start is how you came to this album like we're talking the year 2000 where were you and were you into bright eyes before it well i mean it's gonna be like the most i don't even know cliche is right it's more just kind of appropriate more than anything um uh can you make that sound stop please yes i don't think i heard it around the time it came out it was probably closer to 2001 um at this time despite 
you know, what my entire writing career has, how, how that's played out. Um, I was not, I was like not even aware of like emo or what the heck that meant. So yeah, the first time I heard uh, Bright Eyes, um, like, I don't know if I would call it like cliche or just like the perfect uh, introduction to it all. But um, there, uh, there was a girl in college that I had a huge crush on at the time. And um, she, we, we had a bit of an exchange going on as far as like albums. Like for, I would teach her how to play Travis songs on acoustic guitar. <laughs> Mind you, this is 2000. 2001 and occasionally like she would um you know pass me like she's she seemed to have like much more indie skewing taste than myself or just more awareness of it and uh one of the things she passed me was uh the dashboard confessional album things you have come to fear the most um you know i'm not sure what kind of messaging that was kind of getting across because you know she had a boyfriend at the time uh and you know here she is giving me this album that is all about like unrequited prop pining yeah, uh, yeah but nonetheless you know i i had a lot less self-awareness and um we me her and her boyfriend who she's now married to uh we drove we drove up from um virginia to it was either dc or baltimore to see a dashboard confessional concert and uh she played um the calendar hung itself uh, that was the first Bright Eyes song I'd ever heard. Does he kiss your eyelids in the morning when you start to raise your head? And does he sing to you incessantly from the space between your bed and walls? You walk around all day at school with his feet inside your shoes, looking down every few steps to pretend he walks with you. Or does he know that? Uh, place no idea who he was beforehand, no awareness of Saddle Creek, of Omaha, any of that stuff. And what caught my ear was the, um, the, the synthesizer. It sounded to me like, you know, so you'd hear like a Dr. Dre record or something like that. I'm vaguely aware of like who Neutral Milk Hotel was as well. So, you know, I'm like 20 years old in college. I think I'm like a music nerd, but in reality, I have like absolutely no context to understand anything, let alone emo. Like I would not be able to tell you what emo meant in 2000 or 2001. Like prior like bleed american was the was like my origin story with that so but that that i think gets at this pretty well like you say yeah. in the review you kind of talk about how like in retrospect you look at this and it's hard to find the traces of like it's it's i think that a lot of stuff was kind of figuring it out figuring out what it even was at that time and mm -hmm. so my story with this record was a girl that i went to high school with a friend of mine who went still friends with her hi ashley she was into I, mean, I was into like pop punk and and a lot of this stuff and right and then and and she was the first person that started using this term emo i didn't have any i didn't have any basis for it either i don't know either way she sent me i went off to college that was a freshman that year and i remember she sent me with a burn cd of fevers and mirrors right uh, the band rival schools <laughs> and get up kids and i i wow. maybe i put on fevers and mirrors one time and probably heard two minutes of the intro track and was like don't know what this is. So yeah, Bright Eyes albums always start like uh, with, uh, when I interviewed Connor Overs uh, about the last record in 2020. He talked about like how it's very important for them to have like an intro to chase off the squares. What's the difference, Marco? I want you to stay next door wherever I can. I guess it only makes sense that the one their most beloved record is the one where there's maybe like a 15 second introduction, you know, it's like, let's check the box of the intro track thing and get right exactly, into like an yeah. extremely catchy. Yeah. Um, well, I don't, and I mean, at that same time, it was funny. Like I was listening to, I was listening to those first two dashboard confessional records and feeling good and sad about them and like getting, but, but it's, what's funny is like in the year that followed, I grew away from that probably out of some like, uh, self-perception, like this doesn't seem cool to like or something. I, I don't know. Right. I had Kazaa on my computer and like an ethernet connection for the first time in my life. And then right. lifted came out and lifted was like, I went back to fevers and mirrors uh -huh. after getting like nine of the 13 songs on lifted and realized, <laughs> Whoa, this is like, this is good. Yeah. And by the time like lifted came out, I was like, so in the fucking tank for Saddle Creek. Like, I don't like, I know the lifted anniversary, the 10th, no, the 20 year anniversary is coming up. And 
I don't know if I could really write a 20 year uh, anniversary piece on that album because it, it's just inextricable from like what it what it felt like to be right out of college, completely aimless, um, just like nothing gets crossed out. Like it felt like my life, except for the part where um you know he talks about like getting back together with tim casher and like making music it's like like we're heading into really dicey territory with uh 2002 that and like uh the execution of all things rilo kylie or like the ugly organ like i don't think i'm going to be able to write about those but you know fevers and mirrors um to kind of backtrack to talk about like you know how as someone who was listening to like get up kids and rival schools such as yourself like was you know, maybe uh, not into emo being defined as this like kind of wimpier thing. Uh, quite the opposite for me. Like, you know, I was, I like Dashboard. I like Bright Eyes. I like the Love Jimmy world. Um, and uh, it was like this spin article in 2001 that like, you know, that was like the first time I ever read about emo. And I was like, oh, wow, there's like a name for all this like super wimpy music that I, <laughs> it's being sad about girls yes like finally it's about time that there's like a genre for me like a rip you know a sad like uh like hard drinking college kid um cool man give give me more of this stuff where can i find more and that's where it all began for me um but yeah fevers and mirrors um i think i associate it more with that sort of melodramatic time where it was still like kind of kind of fun to be that extra <laughs> yeah i mean i think i think that's where like okay so it gets a 5.4 from taylor m clark in that pitchfork review and it's basically <laughs> talking about how dramatic it is right it's yeah and then your review 12 years later yeah is not is not denying that it is that dramatic oh it absolutely yeah. you, you being that dramatic doesn't automatically make something bad no of course not and you know i think it's i remember reading all of those reviews back in the day like that one clarity bleed american like uh the ones about like wood water like all like all of those brett t crescenzo emo reviews and like i mean look at me now like you know i've written for them for the past like 15 some odd years so obviously like something about that website as a whole struck a chord even though they like were you know hating very loudly on the music that I love the most. Oh, stay with me every night until the wolves are away. Yup! I would imagine that right now, at, or even 10 years ago, as like someone who's in their 30s, or you know as myself right now like 41 going on 42 um whatever the current answer to bright eyes is i probably don't get it and if i were to review it i would probably say the same thing because i'm just not in a position to really um live that way you know i i, I don't you know i i can totally understand like how uh, being at that age, everything just seems so much more overwhelming. Um, and you want music in a way to reflect that. And every now and again, you know, I can find something um, that comes out now that maybe allows me to access it a little. But yeah, it, 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 it I, I think that's just kind of um, how music writing works. Um, that the people who like are in like at the bigger publications probably don't get like what's really happening like in the 18 to 22 year old demographic all that much and you know once those people uh become you know fixtures of music writing then they can rewrite history and the cycle just continues so and i mean i think i don't know it might have been on the indie cast episode i listened to today that you talked about like at that time pitchfork was a little more the like the the high fidelity dick uh guy at the record store trying to make you feel like you're not as cool yeah and um you know like I, I would read that stuff and be like yeah fuck these guys also i totally want to write for them because yeah, like yeah. they because you know their style of talking about music and thinking about music was very similar to mine it was just applied in a different way so yeah it's so clearly smart and also a good review is a better review if you're also given bad reviews and yeah exactly i remember that at that time like registering the fact that like 
every time I opened a Rolling Stone magazine and saw like a Springsteen record or a mm. like just they all had four stars. I was like, they have to be doing this in advance. Like this doesn't there's no there's no way, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, that was at the time where I was like starting to recognize like because I, you know, I read Rolling Stone a ton in high school and I took what they said as gospel. And, you know, I would get to a point where I would you know listen to like a new U2 record. Uh, and I'm like, wait a minute, this is kind of bullshit, man. Like, yeah. uh, like you get, you, like there was something very invigorating about, um, you know, uh, utilizing the internet as it is to um, you know, be, to like not really have good, no gods, no masters, you know, like I think what, and this is another huge cliche. I, I think I've talked about this in another podcast, but yeah, the, the kid a thing like the kid a review is ridiculous as like it seems right now to me that's just that that just crystallized everything that i was feeling as a music listener and a budding music writer at the time I'm like no this right here is a 10 like this is it right here i don't give a shit if it's not bruce springsteen or u2 or mick jagger like this is what it feels like right now to hear the greatest album of the entire decade and yeah and I think, you know, and, and you know, we're getting a, we're, we're getting into a little of the origin story of the website that's been like covered a billion times. But, you know, I think it, it makes sense to reference that in regards to an album like Bright Eyes, which they weren't as positive about, you know. So if I just exist for the next 10 minutes of this drive, that would be fun. that i want to get to like the, the stuff that's in this in this record in just a second yeah something that you've kind of opened my mind to i will say mm. is like the idea of like s- swinging big like trying hard yes. trying mm-hmm. trying to make something get having an idea and like i don't know like putting yourself out there to try and execute that idea which clearly makes yourself there does vulnerability to that there's and and this is like an example of a very young person kind of doing that the, the albums before this still feel like kid in omaha recording his songs you know yeah like this one is ripping off neutral milk hotel like which i didn't quite grasp at the time actually having just read the elephant six book i can see the pretty obvious parallels between that and uh saddle creek so but all right so this idea that he goes for it and tries to make this this record which he does he continues to do versions of that in the next the next Couple, next one definitely yeah <laughs> i don't know like if you come from like an indian punk culture quote unquote mm-hmm. like you're kind of conditioned to believe that it's like it's kind of cooler to not care you know mm-hmm. but if you just show you care a whole bunch and then i mean you're, you're basically you open the door for taylor m clark to basically <laughs> to, to, to basically like read your diary read all the potentially cringy interpretations of your diary which like i yeah. i wrote songs and journals at that time and there would be a fucking nightmare for them to be read by people. Yeah, like seriously. I, I also did that as well. And I mentioned that at the end of the review that like I was, you know, trying to write music at that time, all of which has been lost to the great digital dustbin of history. There is no record of it. I've thrown it all out. Yeah. I mean, I would say that it's, I don't know if it's necessarily cool to not care, but I think that there's more value or just more admiration in bands that like set their sights on a goal and like clearly achieve it with room to spare like and by that i mean you know if you look at stuff that was happening concurrently with like say uh you know interpol or the strokes i mean like those are clearly ambitious bands like they set out to do something that you know hadn't really been done for a while but like you can totally you don't see them straining yeah. to the same degree that you do with like bright eyes or a lot of the stuff that Steve and I love, you know, for example, the new gang of youths album or, you know, the foxing one before that, like a cool band will like pull it off and make it clear, like how they like, but with bright eyes, it's like you could, even when they like achieve these monumental works, like you could just see their fingers kind of like clap, you know, just 
just gripping the edge as the as they're about to fall off or it, it just it does not look graceful um and you know it's like you have to consider like when you're reviewing a record like okay maybe there's like one song where they completely face plant does that like you know does that mean that the, the record doesn't deserve as high of a score or do you like integrate that failure as like kind of a as kind of like the churn of yeah. classic album making you know like do you do you do you believe that every truly classic um ambitious piece of work has to have one song where they just kind of fail so you so you can recognize what they did achieve you know well, like the example you're saying earlier just because like okay say that youtube u2 record is good it's not mm-hmm. a perfect score on your metric if it's just good the kid a example is like good and advancing yeah of in course. a bunch of ways right and so yeah the, i mean the bright eyes one is definitely that way it's like I think it's like simultaneously a, like a, a big attempt at something. It's like a big attempt at something, but also you, you get at this in the review, like not, not, it's not like it's like meticulously produced or high end or anything. I think they recorded it in a house with yeah. during one winter, really with a lot of snow around. Like mm. it's, you hear there, there's a lot of organic and pro and deliberate clunkiness around it too. Yeah. But it, it's I don't know. It makes it all the more beautiful, especially when you look back at it. And yeah. I think I mean it makes it easier to cherish it. Tomorrow when I wake up, I'm fun, my brother, and I'm making him take me back down to the water, that lake where we sailed and we laughed with our father. I will not desert him. I will not desert him. Exactly. And, you know, like, I think lifted to even greater extent, like, really takes even like bigger swings. But like, I think maybe they're like a little more um, proficient and professional in their work. Like, uh, it, it's, it, it sounds a lot more lush, and it sounds a lot more, um, you know, orchestrated, whereas like, y- Whereas fevers and mirrors, it's just like, oh, oh, let's let's throw that keyboard on there. You know, it's like you get like little like shitty keyboard as opposed to like the brass section. Like I I think at at that um stage, I think that uh you know, Connor Oberst as a songwriter and as an arranger and really like Mike Modis and the entire Saddle Creek um crew were really just starting to get a sense of like what they really could accomplish as musicians whereas like lifted is kind of the final recognition of it it's like this is like fevers and mirrors i think definitely led up to lifted um and uh, but it, there's still something they said for like that kind of transition phase you know what i mean yeah but some people might also say you know letting off the happiness is like oh where they really started to get a sense of like what they were capable of and fevers and mirrors is the zenith of the, their work and lifted is where it got like too, um, you know, mainstream. <laughs> of course, of course, there will be. I have, I have, I have a friend who believes exactly that same thing, and that's perfectly fine. Like I, I had a funny, I had a funny like thing where I saw someone post on a subreddit a question about bright eyes mm-hmm. and like qualify it with like ten things because like prepared for like early heads to like shit on him basically yeah, right but it's like I, I don't know i think i think basically when you're at fevers and mirrors you're that's that's when he he arrives in a way that like is kind of widely known you know letting off the happiness yeah. letting off the happiness i think is that and it can be someone's favorite even but like it still wasn't known yet you know yeah like i also think that like you know there you'll find people out there who will say like in avery island is like way better it's maybe not even better than uh in the airplane over the sea but it's the one that doesn't feel as overexposed and so you can get a lot more out of it when you listen to it now it does feel like by the time we're at lifted like these these are fully composed kind of like t- uh, with the idea fully formed idea in mind whereas like you said mm. fevers and mirrors it's at least half those songs still feel like oberst brought songs in and then they layered 
the things on top of those existing songs, you know? Yeah. Well, something fascinating to me, even as a 19 year old, I think it's pretty understood that like mm-hmm. fever, like especially mirrors, scales, clocks, the sun. I mean, these are just ripe to be used as cliches. Like they're not yeah. those as symbols for things in life in the wrong hands. And they're often in the wrong hands. It's like, I, I love the idea of taking that and making the record and making it work like that stuff. It, it doesn't feel cliche to me. And then you have it asked in that, in that mock interview and mm. addressed in a way that makes me love it even more. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a, fu- a funny, like a funny issue I have with this, cause I want to get into the record itself, but I want to like say this up front is that friend Ashley who burned me the CD that I didn't listen to yeah. until a year later but then that became the thing I listened to as it after like a year of it banging around in my 89 Honda Accord <laughs> was uh when you get a burn CD like that and you only ever have it in that way I'm yeah. atrocious with song titles on this one like, <laughs> I, I've studied up and I'm pretty good but it, like it has the combination of like all those images I just described in a lot of the titles long titles and the year the years of my life when I actually had a decent memory I wasn't seeing them you know? Yeah. I, I think for everything, it like shakes away, like the, the casual people, like on this, this sketch at the beginning, which mm-hmm. it's one thing to do that once you're established and people mm-hmm. and, and, and he is after this, it's another one to do it when you're trying to become something, I think. Right. And then, but, but for everything he denies you and kind of makes you wait for on that six, six and a half minutes, <laughs> track two, it goes, it's all the way in like a scale of me. The different clocks is immediate. Here's a scale, weigh it out, and you'll find these are we more than sufficient of these colors you see were picked in advance by some careful hand with an absolute concept of beauty. They are smeared and these Hey, if you're enjoying this, go over to patreon.com slash after the deluge. Over there, you're going to find extra content, some stuff that's not in this podcast feed, some videos, some written stuff. Um, You'll also get ad-free episodes. And at the end of this season, you'll get a bright eyes zine all about these records, this season of the show that I am making and will very happily mail directly to your home. I would not make this show if I didn't love doing it, but it takes a ton of time and creative energy and... I want to value that, and if you'd like to do the same, go to patreon.com slash after the deluge. Thank you for listening. Do you have, like, favorite songs on this one? Yeah, I mean, I would say that uh, something vague, of course, uh, movement of a hand. I, I That was when I, like, when listening to the CD where I really kind of, like, dug in and realized, like, okay, there's something different going on here. Um, the way that like it's based on like keyboards as opposed to just the acoustic guitar. I mean, uh, the, the calendar hung itself. Uh, that was the first one I hear. And obviously like that's the most like, you know, the most petulant, uh, angsty song. So that's yeah. <laughs> the, the most immediate one. So. Well, I drug your ghost across the country and we plotted out my death in every city. Memories would whisper, here's where you rest. I was determined. Um, Hawaii, Hawaii. I mean, that's also an, another classic. The laughter pours from under doors in this house. I don't understand the sound no more. Seems artificial, like a TV sound. But Hawaii, 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 Hawaii. Persuaded must be satisfied center of the universe uh i'm starting to name them all but like those ones in particular stand out to me um i'd say that honestly listening back to it it batting average wise is very high like it like lifted lifted easily has like four or five of of my favorite songs he has and it's probably my favorite record he has but this this whole whole album's good yeah i i mean for me it's like whenever i listen to lifted i always fast forward waste the pain i think that's like that's just like a a, (laughs) that is a skip every single time uh i think to me that kind of um presages in some way what he would do on on wide awake it's morning which is a record that like i am very very open about disliking um it seems like he he's capable of making that record anytime he wants but always yeah like through went sideways on it to keep it more challenging and then he made it yeah 
for a sunrise or a sunset Your lover is an actress, did you really think she'd stay? For a sunrise or a sunset, you're either coming or you just left But you're always on the way Now, mind you, like Lifted, I think has like the higher highs Um I would say, you know, songs like Method Acting and, um, you know, Nothing Gets Crossed Out. I mean, it, to me, that's like the Bright Eyes song or Lover I Don't Have to Love. Like those are the the highs of that record are are higher. But, um, you know, there are also some songs that I find to be less compelling. Um, so, yeah, like I think that's I think that's what always keeps the, um, you know, when I choose to have the would you take uh viewers and mirrors over lifted conversation um for me like it's always interesting i never ever settle on one yeah yeah have you ever have you ever read your your co-host's bright eyes album rankings <sighs> i didn't all right i'm gonna i'm gonna run them to you okay well, I saw them right before this wait wait is this is it was this published on up rocks or <laughs> up rocks in 2020 okay if you were to guess if you were to guess his least favorite what would it be um okay it's definitely not casadega um okay does this include the newest one no it, it does not does not okay i'm gonna say his least favorite is probably um people's key people's key people's key is second second least favorite then it's then then, then the least favorite definitely has to be then um uh, digital ash yep you got it you got it yeah <laughs> then collection of songs letting off the happiness fevers yeah. and mirrors is four casadega is uh, three Wide awake, it's morning too, and uh, lifted one. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that just kind of reflects, uh, yeah, the fact that like digital ash and digital learn is bought like that one. I actually like more than uh, I'm wide awake, it's morning, but you know, I am and Casadega, I think for so long, like, as that's like one of those records where people it's been called underrated for so long that I actually think it's kind of overrated now, so um, yeah, but I think that. It just reflects Steve's personal taste and mine would look a little different. I'm, I'm curious. I'm like waiting to listen to the records like like very, very closely as I get to like to them in this podcast series. But mm-hmm. Casadega was the first one that I actually went to the record store and bought like oh, in real oh. time as it came out. And I thought it, it, it what you're describing is happening with Casadega. And I think I don't really get it. It's like, like I think you guys were talking about it with uh mm like the second um, band of horses record versus the first one, or people, <laughs> people have done this with like Sam's town and, and the first killers right. record. But I mean, I think Sam's town actually is better. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't know. I feel like there's an overcorrection on, on Casadega. It'll be interesting to see what they do. Cause they're re-release. I know they're re-releasing the first three. I'm not sure what's, if they're going to continue on from that, but so something I find, tell me if, tell me if this makes right. resonates with you. Like I find that the, um, this album has a, a lot of what's good about it is it it has these like release moments like there's a lot of like something might start a little dissonant and mm-hmm. like not necessarily melodic but then it releases you into like summer's gonna come it's gonna cloud our eyes again no need to focus when there's nothing that's worth seeing well, summer's gonna come it's gonna cloud our eyes again no need to focus when there's nothing that's worth seeing so we trade there seems to always be like a dynamic build and Mm -hmm. a here's the big open sweet moment before it retreats from that you know yes i feel a lot of that in a way that definitely wasn't on the previous two yeah i think that there's you know a bit more um a bit more like i guess like classical not classical but like I've heard it oftentimes compared to like worship music. Like, uh, you know, my wife is, uh, has a background in that realm. And, uh, you know, she, (laughs) there are certain bands where she kind of identifies, uh, if they have perhaps like a background in, 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 in church music or whatever, because, uh, there, there are certain chord progressions, certain melodic progressions that, um, work very well mm. with worship music and i think that there is a, a higher degree on that uh with fevers and mirrors you know you listen to a song like um you know something vague now and again it seems worse than it is but mostly the view is accurate you see your breath in 
like that. It's got that like uh, don't know woman, no cry. <laughs> poor progression. I'm not sure I'm going to forgive you for that in the yeah. in the review because now I'm well, gonna look hear, everyone, everyone. I'm going to hear it every time. You know, it's like the same thing as like the glycerine um, core progression, like you know, or when I come around. Yeah, like those yeah. are just things that you just if you really break it down, that progression is like used like time and time and time again. And um, there's just like a little more classic melody going on here, which I think again kind of predicts where Bright Eyes was going. Like they. You know, like, oh, we want to make songs like Neil Young and we want to make songs like Bob Dylan, you know, and all of who didn't make particularly like um, harmonically complex music. Yeah, yeah. I think there's uh, there was around the same time there was a, a YouTube video or maybe it was like E-Bombs World or something of like, <laughs> the, <laughs> there I'm, really try- I'm really trying to place us into in yeah. that. <laughs> But of like a guy, a guy playing like a stand up comedy guy playing a guitar and playing all these different medley of songs that are just the same chords to canon. And- yeah, I know. Yeah. exactly. What a you're lot of them are those ones uh-huh. you just mentioned. So yeah. I'm a lot of things. This is hard to you. I'm born. I'm born. I'm born. I'm born. He was a boy. She was a girl. Could it be any more obvious? We're not going to take it. No, we ain't going to take it. On your market, say go now. Got a dream and we just know now. No woman, no cry. This is a funny Taylor Clark uh, sentence from the from the review. Uh, Initially, he seems racked with intense emotion, but listen closer. His voice has one setting, unsteady quaver. Hmm. He sounds hypothermic. <laughs> I think that's so funny. It's a great, you know what? But that's a great description. I it mean, is. Like, and, you know, like one thing that, um, I don't know, like got me, uh, engaged with uh, the last Bright Eyes album, uh, Down in the Weeds, where the world once was. I guess that the name of it. I'm probably getting it wrong, but um, yeah. it's, not, it's not something I've said out loud often. Uh, <laughs> but like he kind of returned to that uh, sort of style because I that was like definitely missing on People's Key and uh, in Casadega, and yeah, you know, it's like he became like in some capacity like a better singer. But, you know, it's like that that hypothermic quaver, like where you really imagine that he is recording Arianette like in the yeah. middle of a fucking cornfield in Nebraska in the middle of winter. Like, <laughs> I think it gives it a sense of place that um, it's not proficient or quote, quote unquote, like good singing, but like it's effective singing. And, you know it's just one of those things that as artists you know get voice coaches and learn how to like um you know pace themselves while they're on tour yeah yeah mm-hmm. yeah i mean it's it's the kind of thing like that's that's clearly not just how his voice would sound at its most most natural there's a thing being put oh, yeah. on there's a thing being put on and it's being put on to emote and everything and in this moment as a 19 20 year old he's that's that's where he's at with it you know yeah. and um yeah I think something something I find with Bright Eyes is that like, and, and I thought about it while listening to this record a lot, is that like, I come away often not not having a, a full understanding of the song, a song's meaning, but oh, no. always having four line stanzas that leave me like, Jesus fucking Christ, how do you write this at 19 years old? Like, I don't, right. I, that, that I just absolutely love. And I mean, he continues that on through his career. And that's, that's really like a, like, Bob Dylan's the ultimate example of this. Like Bob Dylan, like you listen to those Highway 61 revisited songs and you can't make heads or tails of a lot of it, but they all are so, it's so striking and cool. I'd say mm-hmm. that, I'd say that that new um, Big Thief record, I think she's kind of made that for herself. Like mm-hmm. she's talking about like, like Spud Infinity and things that I, it's like, yeah. I'm not even meant to understand what this is exactly right. saying, but it doesn't <laughs> matter. It doesn't matter. It sounds cool. This person ha- is is free, you know? Yeah, I think that, I mean, with him, perhaps it's that combination of being like super, like, uh, like ungodly talented, but also like lacking the sort of like self-conscious editing impulse. Like it, it, it's just a thing that it might be more difficult to access. And, you know, I think with, with Big Thief, they were just like talking about like, they just kind of like dropped any sort of. Uh, concern about like what other people think and they would allow to you know just kind of chase their weirder um you know their their weirder impulses and i think maybe that's where like the genius level type art that we're talking about comes from where it's like uh you know if you really try to write something like you really try hard to like you know write a bob dylan song 
um, it probably will come off as stilted or just like you, it will, will just make you think of a Bob Dylan song. Um, and you know, fevers and mirrors. Um, the reason I, I think I, I probably mentioned this in my review is that I, he was still being Connor Oberst. He like I think on later albums he was trying to uh, write in the mold of you know a Bob Dylan or a, a, a Towns Van Zant or a, any of those sort of people. Yeah, um, yeah. And so, yeah, it's, and it's true, like when, you know, you read about like Neutral Milk Hotel or whatever, it's it's having genius, but also ha- almost being able to like block out any sort of not just like self-doubt, but like import, like import from outside of your own head. It's like just following your artistic instinct um, and, you know, just expressing yourself as truly as possible. And that's where... Uh, you get this music that to me, I mean, it, obviously it has some precedent, but it sounded like nothing else I had ever heard. Yeah. That's a great way to put that. I think, yeah, it's like a lot of talent, a lot of artistic originality and talent and like limited exposure to the world and yeah. just, uh, production abilities and all that. Like yeah. that, a lot of, a lot of people's favorite work is, I mean, it's, it's not coincidental that first and second albums put out by a lot of people are everyone's favorite you know yeah yeah that and but i mean it, it, but it's not a hard and fast rule i think some artists like um once they, they they kind of discover it takes them a few albums to discover their voice and once they do that and you add that to the confidence and of you know just artistic you know just the confidence of like creating something where you know it's great and also getting feedback like hey what you're doing right now is really awesome keep going yeah um that is that 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 can work as well we see that a lot with bands who like um you know hit a stride you know like the national for i mean uh, you know with alligator um that's real like that's where they that's where things started to get interesting you know like the first two that's like they were still just kind of discovering who they were um and some artists do that they go through this quite derivative sort of phase and then you know they they some way or another they just discover oh this is what we're meant to do yeah yeah right it, it's true with bright eyes as well because i mean you know fevers and mirrors that's definitely not the debut i mean like yeah there was, i mean and he, he you know commander of venus and like all these other things that he did beforehand it took a while for him to get here but he just you know he was making music since he was like 13 and shit so yeah. it only seems like something immediate yeah it's hard to think of like oh yeah you put out your first record when you were 14 years old or whatever yeah it's, you know, it's like i mean it, it's it's a real record it's right here sitting in front of me on my streaming platform but mm. ah, it's wild it's just crazy yeah. uh all right before i let you go into your weekend let's get to all that right. let's get to that uh sketch that skit <laughs> that we got <laughs> because i have to cop i have to cop to like I, I didn't think it was real, obviously. Yeah. I did definitely think it was Connor. It seems yeah. to me, it did seem, it seems to me like the reviewer, the original reviewer knew that the f- host was a mock host, but did take it pretty seriously. Like did interpret it pretty seriously. Um, I did not know that was not Connor Oberst until I read your review. Really? A, a month and a half ago. <laughs> That's awesome. amazing. Hi, we're back. This is Radio K- and we're here with Connor Oberst of the band Bright Eyes. How are you doing, Connor? Fine. Thanks. Just a little wet. Oh, it's still coming down out there. Yeah, I sort of had to run from the car. Well, we are glad you made it. Now, your new album, Fevers and Mirrors, tell us a little bit about the title. I notice there is a good deal of repeated imagery in the lyrics. Fevers, mirrors, scales, clocks. Could you discuss some of this? Sure. I figured it was like Connor Overs making fun of himself, but like, like I, I think with that that interview, it can go a couple of ways. Like, first is like you could take the Taylor and Clark version where it's like it's an actual interview, like it's a staged interview, and it's being played like completely straight. Which, as the interview goes on, I don't know how you can do it. Yeah, you can think of it that way. I mean, maybe if you just like turn it off halfway through. Um, but you know, for me, it's like here you know it's like him roasting himself you know oh, like let me I, let me read you real quick it bears repeating on a record often accused of taking itself too seriously it's create its creator allows his friends to conduct what is basically a five minute roast yeah and i thought it was like him roasting himself but you know as i found out that like it was like todd fink i think from uh the faint 
yeah. playing the role of Connor Oberst, it's like, well, that that's really fucking funny. Like, I mean, I don't know if there's like an, a, I don't know if there's any other precedent for someone doing something like that. <laughs> I, I can't, I mean, when you listen to it, it's simultaneously like there has to be some level of s- script to this, but then certain, at certain points, it like, it is definitely not scripted. Yeah. They're just kind of reacting to each other. Yeah. Um, it's fucking weird and, and kind of meta about the album, but also telling you that something means something and then telling you immediately after that it doesn't. Yeah. Um, and then when the, when he says, <laughs> when he says I had five brothers who died that way about the bathtub, yeah. you hear the host like kind of, there's like a little laugh that comes that you just yeah. know, you know, is in response to hearing that, you know? Yeah. Now, let me know if I'm getting too personal, but there seems to be a pretty dark past back there somewhere. What was it like for you growing up? Dark? Not really. Uh, actually, I had a great childhood. My parents were wonderful. I went to Catholic school. They have, they had money, so it, it was all easy. But basically, had everything I wanted in time. Really? So some of the references like babies in bathtubs are not biographical? Well, I did have a brother who died in a bathtub. Drowned. Actually, I have five brothers that died that way. <laughs> no, I'm serious. My mother drowned one every year for five consecutive years. They were all named Patrick, so that's... They all got one song. Man, I, I I really do wonder if like Todd Fink has this like uh, sketch comedy career that I mean, with the faint winding down as they are, co- like maybe like Todd Fink will be the the Saddle Creek person who has like you know the the, the coolest career in their fifties. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good idea because that's an extremely good uh, audition tape. And yeah. What's so What's so good about it is that like, I mean, it seems like a full a full on getting into character yeah. from a person who knows that character. I don't know that character, but he gets into it so perfectly as it relates to all the songs I hear on this record. And yeah. just the, one of my idea of bright eyes that I'm not lying like that sketch. I didn't hear a, an interview with, with Connor Oberst for years after that. It was yeah. only that sketch, that sketch therefore is Connor Oberst to me. To some yeah. degree, like you can't, you can't put that back in time. We've, we've lived our lives out since then. And that's just like, it shaped my perception of who he is <laughs> both seriously and as someone funny, but it wasn't even him. Yeah. Uh, and, and they got the voice right as well. Like uh, yeah. I have interviewed Connor and uh, I mean, his singing voice does have like some remnants of his, uh, you know, talking voice. Uh, it's, I mean, cause there aren't any other funny parts of that record it is, no. so dead. it is so dead serious i mean but um yeah it's it, like I, i'm just trying to imagine like uh, like if bony bear did that on like for emma forever ago or something like that completely unimaginable yeah it's i'm just trying to think of these other like similar records uh that you just like get interrupted by like by by, by like a skit um i mean like look don't get me wrong i don't want like i don't think skits really work on a lot on like uh, indie rock records but i'm not looking for them but as far as that this this one is so amusing yeah and perfectly placed you know that attempted attempt to skip or or no uh attempt yeah an attempt scales. to tip the scales is this great song that's only like mm-hmm. two minutes long and kind of you place it there and then when he ends that conversation that interview by saying like here's a, this is a new song yeah it's all i haven't written yet <laughs> i haven't written yet i've been needing to write it like cool. i'm like not gonna lie it, it, it's also kind of it's just this like acoustic picked out song with a little toy piano being kind of like splashed around in it and it's mm-hmm. like i don't know it shapes my perception that it's it feels like a song not not like he's writing it in that moment obviously mm-hmm. but i don't know that that little skit had some kind of power over me and yeah i don't want i don't want to skit like multiple of them through the middle of it to break up this album but it's yeah. like it's almost like chat like song 12 is an epilogue or something it is yeah it's like some song i had a um no i didn't have a i didn't have a burn cd i had a i had the um actual cd but it was scratched and i want to say it was like that song uh, um a song to pass the time <laughs> where the scratch was on so like i i think it took me 
a very long time to hear the entire album. Like I, I you know, a, as it's intended to be played. There's a middle-aged woman. She's dragging her feet. She carries baskets of clothes to a laundromat. While the Mexican children kick rocks into the street And they laugh in a language I don't understand But I love them Why do I love them? Nice. Well, uh, thank you for coming on. Any, yeah. any, anything else about this record you feel like you want to say before I let you go? It's a good record. I think you should check it out. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, where can people find you on the internet or any social now that i've got it all cleaned up you can come uh find me on twitter at uh at e as in elephant and as in nancy underscore cohen you can find me at pitchfork you can find me uh sometimes i write for spin and stereo gum up rocks but uh also indiecast new episodes every friday on your favorite streaming service I, if Steve's listening, I hope I get that right because he's the one who usually does that announcement. If you care about fevers and mirrors and bright eyes at all, you're going to like IndieCast. So search that, re listen to podcasts. Right on. Ian, thank you again. Hey, thanks, man. You make me happy. Oh, and skies are gray. Yo, if you're still here, go over to the Patreon. If you made it this far, you're going to like it. Just go give it a look. Oh, the skies are gray. Something chest with hands stretched towards the